That's different than the other way of running another operating system, which is software emulation. So in the case of software or operating system emulation, what we're going to do is we're just going to use software and we're just going to kind of run a program without actually trying to pretend to be the hardware. And so a good example of this is the Wine project, um, Windows in Sunday in August, um, run a Windows app under Linux without having run Windows. Um, I've never gotten a Wine app to run. Anybody get a Wine app to run for real sort of? I don't know if you're there. You guys are better than I am. Um, I, I use my Mojo in other places. My cow is off or whatever. I don't know. Wine has never worked for me. And then I've had the audacity to try to run it under Mac, and that really doesn't work for me. So VMware is a product that actually tries to pretend to be the hardware. And it does a really good job at pretending to be the hardware, so good that the operating system that it runs thinks it's the hardware. Um, so let's kind of talk about a little bit real quickly with the different flavors of VMware. We have a VMware workstation, which we run on Linux and Windows machines. And this was designed primarily for programmers. It has a lot of full featured stuff in it. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. When you guys are doing networks class, or if you're in senior research and you're doing a networks research project, uh, the workstation product is probably what you want to look at. Related very closely to that is the free VMware server. And I say it's the free one because if you're not willing to shell out a couple thousand dollars for the expensive one, you can download the VMware server product that's not the expensive one. And it's basically just workstation that's designed to start up with your operating system and run your virtual machine and then on demand let you see what's going on. Um, I've seen some companies use that and it works pretty well. We here use the expensive product because they give it to us for free. So, haha, uh -huh, we're lucky you're not. Um, actually, you can get it for free too. You just need really expensive hardware to run it on. Um, we can cover that when I'll shift over and I'll show you the remote console for that. In that case, what the VMware really expensive server does is it runs a small Linux kernel that is very not full featured. Um, in fact, there's not much installed in it at all. And then they load their own kernel modules for that kernel. So I can't like install Ubuntu and then run ESX server. I have to use their Linux kernel and run ESX server and it replaces all the guts of Linux with their own stuff. So by doing that, it ends up kind of giving more performance. They've made their own file system and all kinds of crazy things. So the real server version is actually kind of nice. Um, I'll show you that after I show you the workstation. And then the third product is kind of, well, the fourth product is kind of common is Fusion. A Mac, you're stuck with Fusion as opposed to Workstation. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of Fusion, and it's just a watered down version of Workstation. Many people have used VMware for anything real at this point. And so, not everyone's installed a VM. Um, first of all, you can get VMware for free. Let's start there. Um, you can get, get, get it for free because I signed my life away uh, to let a license agreement that I'm not a camera recording. I'm sure I had legal authorization to sign away. If you go to HTTP, Clipper, CGI, then CGI, this is probably Jess, this is somewhere else on the website? Yeah. Okay, I don't know where it is, I just remember the URL. If you go here, it's going to take you to a cute little form that um, one of my RT students made last year. Um, you have to agree not to use it for building nuclear weapons, but that's probably a good idea anyway. Put in your CS credentials. So the same credentials that you use to log in, hopefully they work. And when you do, it will redirect you to the VMware uh, site. And I think for you it should say student. For me it says student, uh, faculty and staff. Oh, you guys don't get to run the server because you're not back. But if you get to download Fusion, uh, VMware Workstation 6.5 or 7, these products work for either Linux hosts or Windows hosts. So if your native operating system is Windows XP or Windows 7, you download the Windows version. It doesn't matter what you intend to run as a guest. So under Linux, you can run another Linux operating system or you can run another Windows operating system. Under Windows, you can run Linux or even another Windows operating system. Um, so you can kind of get the best of both worlds. If you have Windows 7 and you have an application that requires Windows XP, then you can download Workstation for Windows and 
make an, a Windows virtual machine that runs Windows XP and then run Windows under Windows. That's too much Windows. Um, anyway, go ahead and download it. Uh, pick the version you want. It'll say quantity free, or the cost is free, the quantity you want. You can download it once for 12 months and you'll get a license key that you can then uh, fill in and it's attributed to you. So if it shows up on a uh, uh, news group someplace and you share your license key to download and install VMware, they'll know that they gave it to you, not to me, it to you. And then they're going to come down and take your first one as opposed to mine. All right, so that's the academic license that we have with VMware. I just got an email from them that they're now selling an upgrade where you can buy an upgrade from your student license to a perpetual license for a couple bucks. So they're trying to get people to take advantage of it. So once you leave our Powell Hall, you can continue to be a VMware user. On here, on our machines, if you want to go ahead and run that, they should be under system tools. And what's going to happen here is the VMware workstation front end is going to pop up. And at this point, I can, um, I'm going to go ahead and create a new virtual machine. So, what kind of virtual machine do we want to create? Let's go ahead and do a Linux because I know that I have that lying around. So the first thing it says is you need to give me an installer disk. Um, I don't have the installer disk, but I have it as an ISO. So I'm not going to put a CD in my disk drive. I'm just going to go grab one. And I happen to have the Ubuntu image up here in the AFS server. Then it wants to know, how do you want to install Linux? So I want to create the user with the user, ABC, it's a really secure machine. Where do you want to create it? Well, I don't want to put it in the file server space because it'll take a while. So I'm going to go to the work directory. All these machines should have a work directory. So I'll create an example folder and we'll put it right there. Now when you're creating your first virtual machine, it's going to ask you about how do you want to store your disk files. And there's two schools of thought about this. One is if you intend to really load up a lot of stuff into your virtual machine, like I have a Windows XP virtual machine that I have all my Windows garbage junked up into. Um, I made that, and I've got stuff for the embedded stuff, or the embedded courses, and so I've got like 80 gigs worth of stuff. So pick a maximum disk size that's about what you would think you're going to use. You can always grow it later on, but then you have to use a tool to make Windows grow it. Like Windows doesn't just magically grow. And so pick the size you think you're going to need. And under the store is a single disk file or under multiple files. This really depends on the operating system that you're running on. If you're running it on a Linux box, you can pretty much go with the single file stuff because you have no limit, reasonable limit on the size of your files. So I can make a file that's 80 gig and Linux is going to be fine with that. I don't know what the biggest file in Windows is anymore. I got burned by it the other day. I had a, a disk drive, maybe it was just because it was an external disk drive and it was fat, not be fat or whatever, but it went to write the one byte beyond two gigs and it failed. And I was really angry because it took a long time to write that first two gigs. And I had to do it all over again. Uh, so it doesn't matter as far as VMware is concerned, but you would get a little bit more performance out of the stored as a single disk file than if you say, do it more. But it makes it harder to move your virtual machine around because then you have to move an 80 gig file between machines or something like that. All right, so we have a 20 gig machine. Um, by default, it says it's going to give me 512 megs of RAM. It's going to make a virtual CD. It's going to make a virtual floppy disk. It's going to make me a virtual USB controller, printer, and sound card, and a video card, and a processor, and all that other business. But 512 megs of RAM isn't very much. So what we can do is we can go in tweak the settings of this machine. So by going into customize, we can then change the settings. And why well, this is new. I haven't seen, this is version seven. I haven't used version seven in a little while. So this is some kind of a slider bar, and we're saying the maximum amount of memory that you can give it, the recommended, and the gas minimum. Well, 512 megs isn't very much, so let's go ahead and make that 
Yeah, two gigs is pretty good. And under processors, if you have multiple processors in your machine, then you can emulate multiple processors. Let's stick with two. Um, virtualization engine is something you probably want to leave off. Um, depending on the specific processor and motherboard that you have, uh, VMware is going to choose the virtualization engine. And it's going to try to use some kinds of hardware acceleration, because Intel has been look, looking at this, and Microsoft has been looking at VMware and saying, we need to make it that it runs in hardware instead of software and run faster. And so VMware will use the hardware mode if your hardware is faster than software. And up until about a year or two ago, it was the case that Intel's latest virtualization hardware was slower than software, which is kind of surprising. It doesn't happen very often. Um, but it was. Um, so leave it on automatic, but you can click on the drop down. And if you know that you have these extensions in your processor and you just want to see if it really is faster or slower, you can go ahead and turn them on. Um, but probably be very careful with that. We'll just leave this with automatic. Um, para virtualization is something else altogether. And if you're really new to virtualization, you probably just want to take a step back away from that. The idea behind para virtualization is instead of running a regular operating system kernel, we're going to run one that knows that it's running under a virtualization system, and it's going to communicate with that. And the operating system, instead of using up resources like it normally would, is going to run a little bit differently, hopefully a little bit more efficiently. And you can download a para virtualized version of Linux and go for the best. But for the most part, I never worry about it. All right, so we're going to leave the processors just the way they are. Like everything else is automatic, but that's what those things mean. Um, we can connect DVDs, so we can connect our virtual machine to our physical DVD. So if you have to like burn a file, um, you can burn a DVD under Windows or vice versa. Uh, you won't believe me when I say this, but I actually had a DVD that was a legitimate copy to make a backup of, like I wasn't stealing it, and I couldn't do it under Mac, and so I had to use Windows to make a copy of it, and so I had to put it into VMware. But it's kind of weird that I really had to make a legitimate copy of something that the owner said I could do it on, but it was encrypted, and so I had to use the perfect tool to make it. It's all a big thing. But I could use VMware to do that because I could give Windows access to my DVD. Um, if you really want a floppy disk, you can have one. Um, the network adapter, this is going to allow you to talk to the internet, talk to your local network. And there's three ways that you can set this thing up. The first way is probably the most general, and that's NAT, network address translation. And in this mode, let's, my virtual machine communicate with the internet through my host computer's network connection. So as far as the rest of the world is concerned, my virtual machine doesn't exist. No one can see it. I can't serve files. can't use it as a file server or anything like that. It's basically a client only. The other way that we can do it is we can do this differently. <coughs> and it will allow my virtual machine and my host machine, this guy, to talk to each other. But I can't talk to the internet. This is useful for network testing or when you think you're going to do something that's really, really stupid and you want to make sure that it isn't completely stupid before you get expelled, or like running a hacking script on the university's computers, right? You can do host only and make sure it isn't really going to get you kicked out. This guy is kind of the most dangerous. And what it does is it actually makes, to the outside world, it makes it look like you have another Ethernet card in your computer. So it actually will have a different Ethernet address. It's going to need a different IP address. It's pretend to be another computer connected to the same blue wire going into the back of your computer. Or over your Wi-Fi adapter, you're going to have a different Wi-Fi connection. So the difference between these two is, let's say you're at home and you have protected Wi-Fi and you put a password in. If your host operating system has a password for that Wi-Fi, under that, your virtual machine won't. Because your virtual machine will just share your internet connection. Under bridge, you will have to put that web Wi-Fi password in and have this machine connect over that same Wi-Fi adapter with the same password. So you'll have to install whatever Wi-Fi driver and password thing to make that work. Um, 
So this is, we're going to make a virtual net, uh, network connection to the 